Well, um, hello and welcome everyone. Um, very much appreciated, everyone who uh, appreciate everyone who showed up Friday afternoon after lunch. Hopefully, also after coffee or a big amount of water, so you will not snore here. And um, in order to also try to facilitate no one uh, getting sleepy, I'm hoping that maybe the audience will have um, the uh, remaining energy to participate. Let's make this a conversation if we can. Uh, so I'm not just the only one talking here. All right, so what is open source without collaboration? I'm asking before uh, we go into trying to answer that uh, a little bit about myself so you know who to blame for a hopefully not boring talk. My name is Riliko Vancha. I work as director of community at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. I do a lot of things, um, but I'm trying to focus a lot on really community uh, involvement, participation. I'm a uh, community manager for one of our projects called Starting X, and I will not talk about that project today, but uh, we will talk about really um, the importance of um, not just using and consuming and appreciating open source, but also participating and help building and maintaining whatever open artifacts that we are talking about. So, let's start with the first half of the question. What is open source today? because open source is not a new, ther not a new term. Uh, it's been existing for a long, long time now. But what does this mean? What does this term mean? And what does this term mean to you all? Question, is this a marketing term? Who thinks it is? Raise hands. There's one. Everyone else thinks it's a no. Who thinks it's a no? There's, there's roughly three. All right, and we have more people who abstain. Um, they are not participating in yet, uh, forming an opinion. So um, do we all kind of accept that there are people and organizations who are using open source in a marketing context as a marketing term? Who says yes to that? Yeah, all right. People are nodding and raising their hands. Um, that is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. It means that open source really means something. It is something that catches people's attention for many, many very good reasons. But it is also something that has a huge effect on the open source ecosystem. It kind of creates a little bit of a hype curve for open source itself. And I think we are kind of navigating this hype right now. And uh, I will get back to that a little bit later. So, is open source just free software? Free in the, in the sense of you don't have to pay for it. Who says yes? Nobody. I will not, not ask who says no. Hopefully everybody says no. Um, although, um, would you agree if I said that there are still people and organizations who think about open source particularly that way? A lot of nodding and a little bit of maybe. Um, I do personally have experience with, uh, with people kind of not really saying it out loud that open source is free software, but um, they look at it as something that, that they consume. And through consuming open source, they kind of think about it as something that they didn't have to develop, they don't have to maintain, it's not their problem. They kind of getting it for free which is, again, something that becomes a challenging thing. Is there anything that, that you would, any of you, say if I asked what open source is to you? What is open source in your context? Anyone want to chime in? I have another microphone, if we have brave people around. Anyone? Not yet. All right, we can talk later. Whoa, whoa, wait. Oh, wait, because we have to capture what you say. <laughs> Thank you. I think I turned it on. I hope. Nice. 
I think open source is that format, I guess, um, which helps solve the perennial build versus buy problem in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So that would be um, my two cents there. I like that. I really like that. There's one more. I am a community manager dev rel from GoDaddy in the WordPress space. Open source is our earned community. It is our customers. It is what our customers are, uh, not just that our customers are using WordPress, the software, but also all of that extender community <laughs> as well. So it's also our, the, the partner organizations that are not us, but their software is also <laughs> on our, within the WordPress community on our things too. Great, nice. I love it. Um, any other takes? All right. Uh, I really like how we are going into uh, the things that we share uh, more towards the ecosystem and community. So uh, let's say what the definitions have to say about open source. So uh, recognizing the term, because open source was not the, uh, the first term uh, that, we, uh, that we used in this space. Uh, it was rather free software, but it was turned around to be open source 25 years ago by Christine Peterson, who was um, the person who suggested to use this term. And it was actually kind of sort of an inclusion type of uh, effort uh, to move away from using free software that kind of suggests the free in the monetary way as opposed to freedom and access. and. Um, in that way, they kind of included anyone who thought about open source software or open source artifacts as something that they could use as part of their business. So uh, if you're looking for definitions of open source, uh, you find an open source definition from uh, OSI. I added the link to the slide if anyone wants to check it out. Um, what this one talks about, I will not go into the details, not the point of this talk today, um, but what the takeaway from this one is that it goes beyond just the access of the source code, so not a built artifact, but the source code itself, uh, that it also talks about and looks into distribution, licenses, what you're doing uh, with that source code. And um, this is very important. This is kind of the foundation of uh, why we are all here today. Uh, we all need boundaries and uh, and the way to, to know what we can do and what we cannot do and to be able to respect each other and each other's work. So um, if you're looking for more definitions, um, one from Wikipedia, it also talks about um, the access to source code licenses. However, if you, if you look into the, the Wikipedia page, you will see that it also says that open source software may be developed in a collaborative and public manner. And more importantly, it is a prominent example of open collaboration. I myself like to go there that by today, open source cannot exist without collaboration and that is what will make and should make and we all need to uh, participate in making this ecosystem sustainable. So, how does the landscape look like? Oh, coffee. Um, I did a very brief Google search. Oh, and I got coffee. I love Friday afternoons. Thank you. And <laughs> This is community, people. This is community. Uh, met the gentleman through community and uh, have a lot of work friends and we never worked at the same place. All right, so if you do a quick Google search, I did this yesterday, fresh off the boat data, fresh out of the oven, uh, however you wanna call it, you will find numbers like just in 2022 alone, there were 20, uh, no, 52 million new open source projects just on GitHub because GitHub is not the only place to put an open source project into. I marked the, the sources on the slide. None of this is my uh, data. Um, again, quick Google search, first three uh, matches. Um, 52 million is a large number and it also says uh, 413 million contributions. I mean, I'm from a country 
Hungary that has less than 10 million people as a population in the whole place. Like, you know, I can't even count this far. And uh, that's just 2022 GitHub alone. JavaScript space, they say 25 million JavaScript project versions worldwide, another huge number. And something that um, a gentleman here from Mercedes also mentioned in his presentation, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, doesn't matter, day before, um, that is really interesting um, and nice to see that we have this number that um, 70 to 90 percent of any given piece of modern software solution um, has FOSS in it. So uh, that kind of shows that whether or not you're aware, you're probably already consuming open source code. Um, and that is really, really important. But when it comes to open source, again, just that landscape, that number, there are a lot of challenges that came with something that's that large. One thing is rapid growth. Um, my personal experience, I see a lot of new projects, new repos, new activities, new ideas popping up on a daily basis. There are just a lot of them. And um, when it comes to rapid growth, everybody is trying to do something because it became really, really popular. It became popular for a very good reason, but it is still something that you have to learn, understand, um, and, uh, you know, be a good community citizen. It's not something that just happens from, uh, just happens overnight. So um, don't try to run before you know how to walk. And just because crawling seems faster than walking, um, maybe it's still not the right thing to do. Fragmentation. Um, again, an example that I, that I personally seen um, there has been an effort that at least I've been following, and then another really, really similar one popped up on another continent. And uh, it's also almost the same scope, a big overlap in companies who are supporting the two efforts, and it will be probably almost the same people from those overlapping companies uh, who will actually participate in both doing almost the same thing. So, um, do you really have to have your own way? Or maybe there is more room to actually collaborate and do something together. Food for thought. By the way, if anyone disagrees with me, has a question, thinks that I said something stupid, raise your hand. I have another microphone. There you go. So uh, please, consumer challenge. So there was the... Uh, the 70 to, uh, to 90% number out there before. We all love data. And um, that is the um, something that we kind of, not mistaken um, as open source, but consuming is one thing. But if everyone thinks that, oh, I'm just consuming it. It's not my responsibility. Uh, why would I maintain it? Why would I do anything? Why would I even talk about that, uh, that I'm using open source software? then the whole thing, the whole ecosystem will eventually just collapse. Um, there was a conversation at a conference where I, where I participated where the term freeloaders came up, which is practically anyone who consumes open source without participating. You know, you're just watching from the sidelines. Eh, not my problem. Mm, well, it hurts me too, but eh, someone else will, you know, solve it. And I don't agree with using the term freeloader, but it sounded an interesting one to share because it really points out the problem that if we just keep treating open source software as somebody else's problem when it comes to maintenance, we are all in trouble collectively. The maintainer challenge. So um, freeloaders that, that, that applies for both new and existing projects but when it comes to um, well-established, uh, not new, you know, running in production, it actually works, it's stable, and then you're kind of starting to lose contributors. Why is that? Where did the maintainers go? There are companies who, whose core business is relying on that software piece, and they are still over at the next hype booth. Why is that? 
how is that that piece of open source software down to the level of maintenance is not part of the product development and maintenance cycle internally to that, to those companies who are relying strongly on that software. So, what now? Tell me, what now? What, what do your phones say and the laptops? What now? So, um, the steps towards open collaboration is actually something that you have to realize that is something that you need to do. And there are so many things that we just don't know. I don't know, I've been in here for 10 years and I still don't know. Um, there are so many things that are, I knew how it was, I don't know, five to 10 years ago, but it keeps constantly changing. So we need to observe the ecosystem. We need to uh, observe and, and see what the challenges are, how we, how we can start to participate, how we can start to improve uh, what's not working well. We have to learn. We have to learn about each other. We have to learn about the technology. Uh, we have to learn about communities, uh, how they work, how they operate internally, how communities are collaborating together. Um, and if they don't, uh, we have to share what we know, what information we have, what feedback we have. Uh, many people think that um, collaboration and open source uh, contribution, that's just code. I'm not a developer. What could I do here? Possibly. Um, share your feedback. Are you using that software? Do you like it? Do you not like it? I want to know. I've been working on it so hard. Worked on it for years. There's a feature it took me three years to get into one of the open source projects. Big victory. But after three years of almost literally sweating blood by the end, I mean, it, it's, it was a long process for various reasons. But please tell me, does it actually work? Do you like it? Or did I just do it for nothing? I don't like doing things for nothing. And if we implemented something over the course of three years that you actually totally hate, please tell me so we can fix it. Um, so share what you know and educate. This is something that is every single person's responsibility in this room and overall everywhere on the planet and around the planet who are floating in the space. Um, it is a collective responsibility. You all are here. You already figured something out. Go and educate those who are not here. So many empty seats. I know it's Friday afternoon, but still, so many empty seats. Where are the other people? Where are they? So, um, I wrote up the abstract and I said that there will be solutions. So, here I would like to introduce you a new initiative. We call it um, Community Blueprint. And this is something that, um, that is built on experience, your stories. Are you new? Have you been here for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, 10? What is your experience? What is your story? Share what you experienced, um, what you have to say about open source, the open source ecosystem, the tools, um, language, spoken language, coding language, and help changing someone else's experience for the better. Yeah, we have, we have books out there about open source and I do read books, but sometimes, at least personally, a lot of personal experiences here. Um, the textbook doesn't always translate um, to your everyday life. Just because someone tells you how something works, it doesn't mean that you can apply that process to how you're doing things in your own context, uh, at your company, in your home, wherever this example applies. Uh, you don't always know how to do it yourself in your environment. And then we already made the assumption that someone actually read the book. Yeah, sometimes we don't read the book. And the other thing is, um, there are a lot of people in the open source ecosystem already. So if this is something that you're thinking about doing, you're not alone. We are, a lot of us are here already to do this. And at the same time, um, you are not alone in the sense of there's someone else out there who faced similar challenges as you did. 
who had similar experience, good or bad, something that they learned uh, and, and you also learned. Um, or if not, then maybe you're the first person and uh, when the next one joins, they will feel like they are not alone in this. But again, for that, we all have to act as a community, collaborate, talk to each other and share. Um, and this is what the Community Blueprint initiative is all about. So we all can share our stories. And with that, we might have someone to get started. Maybe we will raise awareness of something that we are just, maybe we are afraid of talking about it. Um, someone just raised the example of, we are talking about OSPOs, but we are not talking about the money challenge. You build up the OSPO and sometimes company leadership, your board will ask, okay, how we are financing this? How does it fit in here? Where does the money come from? Where it goes? How will this all work? If you don't talk about this, how, how will they be able to figure it out? Is it in the book already? But if it's not, if we don't talk about it, we'll never make it into the book. Help someone improve. Um, very often, there are people there who just, they just didn't know. You can't expect people to know every culture, every language, or just know what mood you got up in the morning through a text-based chat. They don't know, you don't know. But if you communicate, if you participate, if you share, then we all will know better. We will have more awareness, more proactivity, and more empathy, which is all crucial for open source. So much further beyond the code. Inspire. Do you have a good experience? My first open source experience was so good that I'm working for a nonprofit open source foundation and I don't wanna go back where I came from. I love it. And I'm so fortunate because I know that not everybody's experience was like that. At the same time, again, this is open source, open collaboration in a public space. If something happened, you know about it, you see it. The same example in a corporate environment, you don't know. When you know sometimes, it's when you read it in the news. And if it's like front page New York Times, that's really bad. And that could be harassment, that could be so many things that happen behind closed doors. And people still prefer that over all the open source, open collaborative public environment where you see it and you can go and act. Not everyone harasses other people because they like doing it. Maybe someone got up in a bad mood and just, they don't know better that day don't always have to take everything personally. At the, same, at the same time, there are people with disabilities, even to the level of the spec the autism spectrum. They are really bad. They are challenged with communication very often, but they are super smart. But if you don't know about um, what they are going through, what their experience is, um, what their disability is, and you just think that, oh my God, this is an awful person, then you know, we're, we're all in a really bad place. But if we share, if we share experiences, share that, that these things exist, then we can all collectively do better. So how you come into the picture, share your experience. Help the, uh, the open source ecosystem by telling your story. How did you come in contact with open source? What have you been doing? Was it a good experience, a good journey, something that you are still struggling with, something that you learned, something that you couldn't solve yet? Let's come and solve it together. Um, the link points to a form that will ask for basic information. What's your story? What's your email address? So uh, we can get back to you and get you be part of um, this ecosystem of people who are helping each other and helping anyone else out there who, who's listening. And with that, thank you all for listening. And now, since we have a lot of time, is there anyone here who would like to share an experience? A good one, a bad one, a frustrating one, or anyone who has questions either what I said or anything that you experienced that you're just, you couldn't really figure out how to put it in the box yet, in a box yet.
slide up there about fragmentation. Um, oh, uh, I don't even have to go back. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, it, I, and I thought that was an interesting one, especially um, with so many foundations um, in place and how we foster better collaboration across all the foundations. Like, you're here, the, you're open infra, one foundation. Uh, I've seen people from Apache and Eclipse and everything. And so um, what's really wonderful about this space is, is that connections that we can make across foundations. So um, I, we do a lot of work to get projects, individual projects to collaborate with each other and all that. But if you could talk a little bit about um, how you work across foundations. That is always a tough one. Uh, I personally, um, I come from a little bit of a telecom background, more on the infrastructure uh, layer, hence I, I guess how I ended up where I am right now. Um, and um, the telecom space is, well, they have their own challenges in terms of moving from standardization to open source. And uh, they are really trying to figure this space out. So I participated in projects like OPNFV, it's Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization, uh, just to help people out with acronyms who hate it as much as I do. Um, that was a project that was created to help the uh, uh, the telecom industry to actually figure out what this whole cloud thing is, how to put um, network functions into a virtual machine. Um, it was challenging, um, but it was really a, a community that formed to do a lot of education at the end of the day, both about cloud and the, the cloud transformation, as well as about open source itself. At that time when that community was created, uh, I was already deep in OpenStack and uh, that community was actually a really, really good experience and a really good example in terms of cross-community collaboration because they were building um, reference implementations of a telecom cloud based on open source components. So what they did is, um, they picked up some of the things from uh, from the OpenStack community, for instance. OpenStack is a large open source cloud platform, so they were using that as one of the, the core base components at that time. This was seven years ago, eight, a long time ago. Oh, I feel old now. So uh, it was a really long time ago, and um, they, uh, they both integrated OpenStack, but also looked into how to not just take the source code itself, but use some of the tests, the test suites that the OpenStack community was, was creating um, to make sure that what they put together, that still works as expected. And when they found gaps, they, they contributed it back to the OpenStack community. So it wasn't a one, one-sided um, activity uh, like, uh, Contributors from OpenStack were helping them to figure out how to put things together. Networking is, is a really complicated thing. Um, it, it's really not simple. So uh, that collaboration also helped the, uh, the OpenStack community, um, who at that time, again, eight years ago, had a bit more uh, data center IT experience and mindset. So understanding the requirements of a telecom environment was unfamiliar. So there was a lot of education going back and forth. We know what cloud is, you know what telco and telco networking is. Let's put the two together. And since then, the, both communities came a long way, but that was, a, that was a really great example. And actually we had a, an OpenStack Summit in Barcelona. <laughs> and we had, a, we had the best ever keynote demo. We had a, like this tall, um, uh, little mobile uh, station there, um, like a mobile site, so you could run mobile phone calls uh, through the servers on stage. And uh, it was actually a failover demo that was put together by, again, a collaboration between the OPNFV, which is a Linux Foundation networking project, by the way, I should have men mentioned that first, um, and OpenStack that, that was an opening for project, uh, well, OpenStack at that time, but, um, the point is that we had a demo where 
I was holding a phone and uh, Heather Kirksey, uh, the director of OPNFB, was holding the other phone outside of the, uh, the, the keynote room. We were chatting on the phone. I was sweating so hard uh, okay. because we had our CEO with like a, this big scissor <laughs> cutting a cable on stage physically and we were like, will the call drop? And I think we had like, I don't know how many seconds or milliseconds or whatever that was. To me, it felt like a lifetime when there was no voice coming back to me on the phone. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, this demo will fail here. And it didn't. So the call actually didn't drop. The, the mobile state, uh, base station, there you go, finding the words. Um, it, it operated as expected. The, the call remained uh, live the whole time. And um, um, that keynote demo is my absolute favorite ever since, uh, not because I was holding the phone. Um, it is my favorite for multiple reasons. One is it was really showing that collaboration between, you know, across foundations and communities because no one could have done that without the other. And the other part is that that demo there really showed that what we all worked on in open source, it's something that you're using in your everyday life. I could have called the ambulance on that phone and the call didn't drop. Maybe I should drop the mic now. I'm having, I'm having goosebumps, but um, that's the best example I can give you. So there you go. That's my story. What's yours? Um, so I guess my story is coming from a non-contributor perspective in a traditional sense, because my background's in marketing. So when I first started working with, and I work with Ildico at the Open Infra Foundation, um, marketing was called sometimes the M word. They're like, oh, the marketer's in the room, we're not gonna actually talk about things, like what are they gonna do, what are they gonna publish? But like, I think you know, it was interesting, like even talking, like listening to the presentation about like, is open source a marketing term? And so, but like one of the challenges I've had was really conveying the value of marketing what open source contributors and operators and ecosystems are doing and doing together and telling that story because it is really powerful collaboration, but you don't want, like, and you want to represent the right parts and you don't want to put a term on it for the sake of putting a term on it. You want to actually showcase what's really going on. And so for me, it was a challenge to gain some credibility of like, we can do this together and I wanna help y'all and you like, I want your project to get more adoption. I want your project to get more contributors. I want your project to get more funding, which of course is a, like you mentioned, a very important thing. So I think making sure that there's goal alignment between marketing and a open source ecosystem was such a valuable step that I underestimated going in thinking from a traditional tech back, marketing background like, oh, there's products to sell. I'm going to market them. The sales will go up, you know? And so that was a shift and it took me some time to really educate and be educated about perceptions, expectations, and results. So that was my story. I love that story. Uh, yeah. Doing it every day and it's so hard. Go ahead. Uh, okay. The, the condensed. In college, I found um, I was the only female in a, in a computer programming room. I found open source because I needed a uh, we didn't have computers in the room while I was learning to code. We had paper and pencil. And a friend put command line Red Hat onto a spare laptop, which in 99 was pretty hard to come by. And I uh, learned all about open source back then. Um, a couple of years later, I was running a classroom teaching, public school teaching. Um, needed to blog for my website, for my classroom. Um, and I had been teaching HTML and CSS, but thus began the foray into WordPress eventually. Um, I went through a couple other CMSs first, found WordPress. Um, went to a WordPress event in 2009, but I found out about it so late that tickets were sold out. So I said, could I volunteer as a means of getting in? So my first time at an open source event was already as a contributor because I was checking guests in, um, which is a great way to get to meet everybody that was walking in the door. <laughs> They thought I was somebody and I didn't know anybody. <laughs> um, and so later on became a member of the WordPress training team in 2014. Um, that very first WordPress event, again, I was the only, I was one of four women in a crowd of a couple hundred. Um, and so things have really changed in the sphere that I'm in now. 
I've been contributing, and two years ago I was hired at GoDaddy, and part of my role is to contribute, but also it is uh, forming an OSPO, telling my leaders and directors why we cannot be the free riders in the, in the uh, tending of the commons kind of examples. And so um, it's conveying that significance of what does open source mean across the company, also what is happening inside the project that my leaders should know about. It's having the conversations with the executive director of the WordPress project, but also while I'm here, um, this is a big foray for me into broadening my understanding of open source, learning more about uh, w the nuances of corporate culture. If I'm coming from my parents and myself, both being in the public school systems, it's a different world to swim in. Um, and so uh, corporate is funny and uh, open source in corporate gets weird. Um, and in the meantime, as a side hustle that has no money whatsoever, I started a project with Open Collective to, uh, with two other friends of mine in the WordPress space. Um, WordPress Foundation does not exist to fund contributors. It's just a trademark and event legal perspective uh, handling those functions. And so started an organization to help get people contributing um, and sponsored to contribute because until two years ago, I had done this for more than a decade by that point, unsponsored and sometimes going through some some pretty rough straits myself in that process with like medical challenges and other things. So um, I don't know, I breathe open source these days, I guess. Thank you for sharing, this is amazing. And I think it's a great example. And it's just, it's so inspiring to hear that, that how far you've come from writing <laughs> code on paper. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think that is so inspiring. And also what you say about, you know, like you're coming from the world of teaching as well. Like, obviously you understand more than probably most of us in the room, how important it is to educate and help others to, uh, to understand why you're doing this, for instance, um, what, what they will benefit from and, and not in terms of money and, uh, and how this all works. I think this is amazing. Who else has a story to share? Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I think this is a good follow-up story, actually. The first <laughs> I want to say, I think it's brilliant that you like created a pathway to that conference for yourself. Like that's just yeah, that's amazing. Um, so I teach computer science, and that's how I came into open source, was I was a computing educator first, uh, really interested in broadening participation, and then met people who were teaching open source, doing really cool stuff. Um, but my story is a teaching story uh, that's maybe just a, to underscore the point of someone's first experience, which is that I developed, uh, with a lot of support, uh, a open source contribution course, which I taught at a liberal arts college. Um, for a couple semesters when I was working there. And my students through that class contributed to the Mozilla Firefox DevTools project um, and was really cool. They made you know successful contributions to the project over two terms. And But the cool thing that I wanted to share with you all is not just how exciting that was for the students, but in particular that the impact of having mentorship from within the community had on them. So we worked with a couple of developers uh, that other faculty had already kind of found to be very helpful. And they ended up doing like check-ins with my students on Slack weekly. It wasn't a ton of work for them, um, but it was a really, really big deal to my students who would gather around a keyboard and say, Emily, can you come read this message before we hit send? You know, and so it was like such a good exercise for them to learn how to communicate and get over the hump of like the scariness of jumping into a community where you're a novice. Um, and the really cool moment for me was the developers offered. They said, hey, like, we have time if you want to do, like, a video stand-up call at the end of the term once with your students. Like, and so we did that. And afterwards, the students, like, as soon as the call ended, they were all like, whoa. Like, they're just, like, normal people who have the Google stuff, too. I was like, yes, yes, that is all of us. We are all just figuring it out and doing our best. So, you know, I think that that students started out being really frustrated in the course, that there wasn't just, like, answers and a blueprint and, like, the, you know, assignments to solve. But by the end of the class, 
Uh, I had multiple students who went on to work at Red Hat after graduating. I, have, I still hear from students that it was one of their most valuable college experiences. Um, so I think that you know, those, those little interactions you can have with somebody new to open source or curious have just such tremendous lasting impact. That's also a great story, like how something small can just change your life. I think that's amazing. And the other thing is, just to add my experience to that story, I, I also did a little bit of training mentorship within the community in a community organized efforts. And I can just tell from mentor perspective, like how much energy we get too from the students, like you're helping someone getting started and they're excited, you're excited. And it just such a great experience on both sides. Yeah, like everyone just amplifies each other. Yeah, it's really exactly, cool. <laughs> exactly. We are kind of running out of time. I think we had one hand up back here for one more story. Are you still open to share your story? Or <laughs> I missed the beginning. So is the idea oh. that you're sharing challenges that you've overcome to help others or the way that <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe clarify. Yeah, I, I can quickly summarize and then we can chat afterwards. Uh, it's also a good reminder for people who are watching online afterwards uh, and we're not able to be here for this one at the same time, you can still participate. Um, so we there's a new initiative that's called Community Blueprint that recognizes the challenges in the open source ecosystem in every context possible. And uh, the idea is that as opposed to writing a, writing a book of how to do open source, no matter who you are, where you're from, what your uh, circumstances are. We would like to collect experiences and stories to understand what people are going through who are either trying to participate in open source, trying to understand open source, or already have a good, bad, challenging, lesson learned, any kind of experience. And then through those stories and experiences, kind of getting to the point of, how to improve the ecosystem, how to solve challenges together, and how to actually apply open source principles and processes and tools within someone's own environment and own context through understanding how others went through the same path that they are just about to either step on or feel lost in. That's the, that's the idea. And if anyone has a story here or who are watching online, um, the link takes you to a form that only asks for like name, email address, and what is your story, why you're excited about sharing it, or, or what is your motivation to share it. And, and really that's all, just so we know who you are, uh, how to get back to you, and how to help you share your experience with the world so they can learn or they can help you overcome something that you just couldn't overcome yet. I think my story is kind of different, so I can just talk to you after, but okay. I just support the idea. And um, if anybody else wants to chime in really quickly, I'll pass the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, I think, I think we are out of time. Um, or, yeah, I think so, because it was only a 40 minute. All right, um, if anyone has questions or would like to share an experience, uh, let's chat afterwards. And uh, those, again, who were watching after the fact, grab the link and then we'll get back to you and chat with you and make you be part of this experience of sharing experiences. Thank you all.